I think the main reason why The Book of Boba Fett was such a disappointment to so many Star Wars fans is because Disney, you were trying to both have your cake and eat it too. You had yourself a fantastic premise. What if we told a Star Wars story, except this time it follows Boba Fett, one of the darkest, most callous characters in the galaxy. And why did this show squander its potential? It's because that idea of a Boba Fett story, while a fun one, is fundamentally incompatible with how Disney wants every protagonist under its umbrella to fit the term hero, to ensure they're a role model for the kids to emulate, and also to ensure it's a show their parents will buy that all-important merchandise around. If you want to tell a story about Boba Fett, you simply must possess the balls to follow through with that ballsy idea. You must let Boba remain jaded and vicious, the kind of man who doesn't care how much collateral damage it takes to get the mission done. The kind of character who, sure, he does good deeds once in a while and has his code of honour, but he has been to hell, and is a man most of the many who know his name fear, and for good reason, as he is willing to do things so dark to get what he wants, he makes the Mandalorian look like bloody Mother Teresa. <laughs> Only we didn't get that version of the character, the version that frankly would have been so much fun to see. Instead, we have a Boba Fett who didn't just know not have the six or so flaws any good anti-hero needs to work, and he didn't have four flaws, or three, or two, he didn't even have one. And that right there is the heart of it. A lot of people were left bored by Boba Fett's character in this show, and this, I believe, is the main reason why. He effectively has zero character flaws, has exclusively positive traits. And that in any character, let alone the protagonist, let alone someone who is supposedly a villain of the Star Wars universe, is inherently boring to watch. Uh, but think about it, Boba is honourable, he never fights dirty or goes back on a deal once it's made. Boba is forgiving. If someone wrongs him, even if they're an assassin who just tried to kill him, he will always spare their life. Boba is compassionate. He treats every animal with love and care. Boba is both humble and emotionally stable. If someone criticises his plans, even if in front of others, he will always remain perfectly level-headed, listening to their suggestions with an open mind. Don't get me wrong, it's fine for Boba to have some redeeming traits exactly like these, uh, vital even. But because Boba is such a goody two-shoes in the book of Boba Fett, as he exclusively makes the mature, responsible and morally right decisions, he makes for a dull protagonist, the kind sadly devoid of nuance, the kind of character who has as much depth to him as your everyday puddle. And it's just such a crying shame, because Boba Fett, despite how we haven't seen very much of him on screen, had the potential to be an incredible protagonist. Dare I say it, he could have been one of the most morally complex characters in the Star Wars universe if more competently written, and that's a potential that Disney sadly, totally squandered. A fair few people have said a somewhat hot take uh, that Boba Fett just never had the potential to be a good lead, that the mystique built around him made him seem like a more interesting man than he actually is. I understand where these people are coming from, but respectfully, I disagree with them. And I'll explain why later in the video, where I'll be doing a full character breakdown of Boba Fett, explaining that he isn't just some caricature of a guy with a helmet, but how he really could have been excellent in the right hands. And then I'll be doing exactly what I did for my Star Wars How to Kill a Friend franchise video I did a while back, where I'll be applying every critique I make in this video to suggest an alternate Star Wars story, an alternate season of Boba Fett, which I hope you'll agree makes a better use of Boba's character, so do stick around for that. But remember Rey from the sequel trilogy? Uh, sorry to all you guys who successfully repressed any memory of her, uh, but she was a pretty weak protagonist, I think most of us would agree there. And it's not because of Daisy Ridley, uh, she did the best you could expect from any actor who's given so little to work with. No, no, to me, the main reason why Rey just didn't work as the lead is because she barely has any character flaws, just like with Boba. And here's the thing, it's fine to have characters who are good people, who are unfailingly noble or kind, but they must have failings in other areas, places where the character is lacking somehow. And it honestly baffles me how Disney keeps on not doing this, making lead characters so virtuous, so perfect, that they are no longer appealing as characters. 
Han Solo is the inverse of this. Almost everyone loves him, yet he also has a ton of character flaws. From his cockiness to how very easy it is to upset him, uh, like when Leia doesn't say bye to him at the start of Empire, so he throws a flon temper tantrum. And sadly, I'm beginning to doubt that we'll ever see another character like Han Solo be a lead in the Star Wars universe, because such a man simply has too many flaws for Disney's liking. What's this? He's forceful with those he loves? It's very easy to upset him emotionally? And he has a larger ego than any of the actual villains do? Like, no, 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 that, that's too much for Disney. They could never allow a protagonist of theirs to be as interesting as that. Flaws are essential not just because they give a character depth, making them both realistic and relatable, not just because character flaws are a wonderful cause for conflict as they create drama with other characters, but also because character arcs are an essential part of good characterization, and arcs are only possible if the character has lessons to learn, stupid opinions and flaws of theirs that need to be dealt with. For example, Han Solo again comes into this. We see him being a bit cowardly and choosing to abandon the rebels in their time of of need in A New Hope, but then when things are most dire, Han comes around overcoming his flaw and saves the day in a way that only makes the climax more fun. If you write a flawless character such as Rey from the sequel trilogy, you'll quickly realise that writing an arc for them such as the one we got for Han is borderline impossible, because what lessons could such a perfect person possibly learn? It's for this reason that Boba just doesn't have much of an arc going on in his show, which is yet another bit of lost potential, another straw on the camel's back that is him being a boring protagonist. It's really a shame how this show was so mediocre, because the Star Wars galaxy has so much rich lore and potential for great stories to be told in it. Every now and then stories like Revenge of the Sith or Jedi Fallen Order come along that prove this. But if you ask me, one of the best Star Wars stories isn't a movie or a game, but a novel, that being Darth Plagueis. Uh, you might initially think, oh, it's probably some silly tie-in book with the prequels, but it's actually incredibly good. Like, I love this one to bits because it doesn't just tell Palpatine's origin, it also fleshes out the depraved aspects of the Sith and makes that whole faction feel so much richer and more interesting for it. It expands upon the lore in all the right ways, and if you love Star Wars, I'd thoroughly I thoroughly recommend you check this one out. And also thanks to Audible, the sponsor of today's video, you can grab the excellent audiobook for Darth Plagueis today totally for free. Audible really is the best place on the internet to grab your audiobooks, and I use it myself pretty much daily as I'm going to the gym or just passing time playing games. For those of you who've got busy lives, audiobooks are fantastic because you can read the books you want to read without making any sacrifices, as you can just listen to them while cooking dinner, commuting around, and just going about the daily things you are going to do anyway. And if you click my link in the description, audible.com slash closer look, or text closer look to 500 500, you'll get a free 30 day trial and a credit you can use to get any audiobook you like. And I'd highly recommend you use it to get Darth Plagueis. Again, if you want to optimize your time in all the right ways, by fitting in more reading without making any sacrifices in terms of how you spend your time, time, do click my link in the description, audible.com slash closer look, or text closer look to 500 500 and grab Darth Plagueis for free today. Uh, but back to Boba's character being altered, it does more than just kneecap Boba's entertainment value. It also challenges believability, because the character is just too inconsistent with his other depictions. There are too many things around him that don't add up. Remember in Empire Strikes Back when Darth Vader says, There will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon, but I want them alive. No disintegration. As you wish. What does this clip tell us? That Boba Fett is a brutal barbarian who is so violent, Darth Vader of all people has to order him specifically to hold back. Like while he's among a group of depraved bounty hunters no less, shining a light on just how uncommonly ruthless this man is. A again in The Mandalorian, we see this callousness of Boba's character only get reinforced, as when he confronts Mando, he doesn't ask for his armour, he demands it. It. And then this happens. What's to stop me from dropping you right where you stand? Because I have a sharpshooter up on that ridge. I'm the one wearing Beskar. I didn't mean she was going to shoot you. 
My friends locked on to that little companion of yours up on the hinge. Boba wants his armor so badly, he's willing to threaten to murder children in order to get it. And would he have actually gone through with that threat if Mando didn't back down? It's dark, it's very dark, and it's also very fun. And like this brutality of his gets reinforced again when he's fighting the stormtroopers in the same episode, and it's got this look of pure, unrestricted hate on his face. But when you compare this to the boba we got in the show, you'll see that this trait of his, this rage that defines him, this, this callous, complete disregard for collateral damage, it's nowhere to be found. You can make arguments till the cows come home about how Boba had his run-in with the Tusken Raiders and that taught him to be a more gentle man. It's a tenuous argument that doesn't hold up to any level of scrutiny, mind you. I have a spare 10 seconds. I'll happily destroy it right now. So when you think about the timelines, Boba threatens to kill Baby Yoda after his run-in with the Sand People. Look, you could even see he's got his Tusken Raider cloak and gaffy stick and everything. So he's still shown to be a callous, cold bastard even after his experience that supposedly turned him gentle. One thing's for sure, there is a really crappy verisimilitude going on with Boba's character where a lot of things just don't add up, as he has massive shifts taking place in his personality for seemingly no reason. But even assuming that that argument is correct, assuming that the legwork was in fact done to justify these inconsistencies, that doesn't do a thing to take away from a much bigger problem, the one that really matters most here. Because this change to his character, it's a change for the worse. Because the brutal Boba, the one who has to be ordered to not disintegrate people because he will do exactly that unless you explicitly order him not to, the one who's willing to threaten to murder children to get his way, he's a significantly, like by literally like 20-fold, a more fun and entertaining character than the goody two-shoes Boba we got in the show. And in a sense, I'm getting some deja vu here when it comes to Loki, because while I would say Loki's show was a much better one than Boba Fett's, their shows are both hampered by this exact same issue. Because the version of Loki we see in his show, he's not really the same character we saw in the films, he's more so a watered-down version of him, where the creators thought that if they took the Loki from the Avengers, being the selfish, scheming Marvel, narcissistic fiend he was, he might not have been a totally likeable protagonist. He might have even been a sort of anti-hero and set a bad example for the kids. Disney could never be so brave as to do that. And so, they changed him out of fear, forcing in a rushed character arc in an attempt to justify a complete overhaul of his personality because they were afraid to not have a 100% likeable protagonist. It's really a shame, but Disney's obsession with only ever telling family-friendly stories is massively limiting their storytelling capabilities. I mean, come on, Disney. It's a no-brainer to think that a Loki show where he actually does unlikable things, like all the way until like the final episode, where the audience wants him to make a certain choice for the greater good, that they want Loki to have a character arc and improve as a person, and he keeps threatening to go on one, and we see that he kind of wants to improve himself, but he frustrates us as well as himself by regressing on his progress progress, going back to his deceptive trickster roots time and time again. Such a Loki would not only be totally faithful to the original character as well as the original Norse myth he was based on, he'd also be a far more fun protagonist. When it comes to Boba Fett and Loki, they both share a lot in common here as Disney very consciously filed away all of their villainous quirks to ensure that they aren't unlikable, and in doing so, as an unexpected side effect, they also filed away most of the reasons why Loki and Boba Fett were such compelling characters in the first place. I will be deconstructing Boba's character in a minute and suggesting a potential rewrite, but there's another really interesting flaw that this show fell for. It's one that I haven't noticed anybody at all mentioning, so I thought I'd bring it up here. It was a good idea to have Boba Fett have his own show, and Boba running his own empire, that also could have worked, but it wasn't complex enough a story concept to work as the basis for a whole season of TV. 
It would have been fine for a one-shotter for perhaps a single episode of The Mandalorian, where Mando was helping Boba protect his new criminal empire, but there wasn't enough meat to this concept to sustain such a long story. You could even see a symptom of this where the writers were like, oh crap, we've run out of plot, we've stretched it thin enough as is to last five whole episodes, but what are we going to do with the two episodes we've got left? And then you can tell that somebody in the writer room said, why don't we just take the first two episodes of season three of The Mandalorian? and just have them here. <laughs> That's honestly why I think we got those two Mandalorian episodes. Not because they were just ham-fisted in for their own sake, but because the writers genuinely ran out of plot and didn't know how else to fill the time they were given. If you're a writer, you'll know exactly what this feels like, where you have like 40% of a good idea, where you're excited to tell the story because you know your idea is unique and fun. But you also know that in order to actually tell a great story, it must be combined with another idea that complements it quite well, making for a truly complete story concept. It's quite evident that the Book of Boba Fett falls for this exact issue. We have Boba, a villain, be the protagonist. That's interesting. That's 30% of a good idea. We also to have it so he's trying to build a criminal empire. That's not exactly mind-blowingly good as story ideas go, but it's a fine idea. In the right hands, it could have totally made for a great story. So that's another 30% of a good concept, but that only adds up to 60. And yes, I am pulling these numbers right out of my bum, but they're totally arbitrary. But those two ideas combined just aren't enough. Like, you can tell this because in the show, too many antagonists are introduced, too many episodes have a very slow pace and don't seem to progress the plot whatsoever and Boba's character development too seems to not go in any real direction either. All of those issues are symptom of a larger, more fundamental problem, that the show's base concept just wasn't complete enough. I'll, I'll level with you guys, I tried really hard to think of that final idea this show needed to have 100% of a good concept, and I pretty much failed. I, I couldn't really realise what it was, but I think the key to it lies in Boba's motivation. I, I think if we were to change it so Boba wants to build his empire, not because he's simply tired of being uh, ordered around, but because there's a tangible mission he wants to achieve, a, a mission that isn't generic like he wants power or he wants to protect people, that right there's the hole in this story's concept, where if Boba's reasoning for wanting to be a crime lord were totally overhauled, giving him some kind of quest he's going on, that would have taken the show to a whole other level and given it the direction that it desperately needed. I can't really think of what Boba's mission might be, but I'm sure a bunch of you watching can, so go crazy with your suggestions in the comments down below. But alright, the time has come. Let's take a closer look at Boba. Who is the man beneath the helmet? Well firstly, we've got that scene in Empire that I already showed of Darth Vader ordering that nobody be disintegrated. This obviously shows him to be a brutal, callous man. But there's so much more to him than this. He's so much more than just cold. You want to know what I think the real key is here to understanding him? I think it's the end of Attack of the Clones when his father was beheaded in front of him. I think that's the key. That's the seed we need to latch onto and build Boba up from there. I think that Boba Fett isn't just a callous man, but a deeply dysfunctional one. He strikes me as the kind of guy who has truly awful social skills. It's not just a case of him being a prick, which he is, but also he just never learned how to interact with people. I mean, he grew up on Kamino where there were no other kids around his age. He never got to socialise, to have friends at any point in his childhood, meaning he never got that chance that everybody needs as a child to interact with other kids and learn how to humanize human, basically. I imagine that every time Boba has a casual conversation, it just ends in awkwardness because he's so awful at it. Uh, perhaps he's sitting at a bar, some random dock worker is next to him or something, and Boba brings up as small talk how he killed a guy the other week and brags about the skill it took to pull off. And then the other guy just forces a smile, nods, and gradually backs away before running away. And Boba just gets confused because he doesn't understand why people don't want to be around him. But more than that, he likes it. He, he likes being alone. Oh, no, 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 scratch that. That's wrong. The inverse is true. He hates being alone, but he hates being with others more. That's a part of his character too, a fundamental part, I think. He hates making friends. Not because he's bad at it, which he is, not because he's an asshole, which he is, but because he's afraid to care, where his heart's closed off, where he refuses to love or befriend anybody, because the only person he ever loved was murdered in front of him. 
And that trauma affected him so greatly, he would do anything possible to prevent himself from feeling that pain again. As a result, he would be crippled by loneliness, living a deeply sad life that he doesn't enjoy. But he carries on with it nonetheless because he knows nothing else. And while he is terribly lonely, he's as hard as they come and has that tenacity about him that very few people in the real world possess. Some some people have said that Boba just isn't an interesting enough character to support his own story. Those people, I think, are categorically wrong. Because while we haven't been given much on his character in these existing movies, the few tidbits we've got are plenty enough to build a totally badass, yet tragic and sympathetic character around. Honestly, if you asked me to imagine what Boba Fett's character should have looked like, I don't think of this compassionate depiction we got, who's so level-headed and wise, he almost feels like a Jedi. It just doesn't add up. Like, it makes no sense how someone with his life experience would end up being as well-rounded and functional a man as what we were given. I think of what he should have been like, and I can't help but think of Joel from The Last of Us, where sure, he's a total badass, but he's also someone tortured, just traumatised beyond belief by a horrific thing that happened in their past. And as they go on their quest, they meet somebody. And it's in meeting this person, that's what sends them on their arc, as they learn to overcome this flaw of theirs, a flaw of being afraid to love, as they feel if they were to love again, the one they care about will inevitably be torn from them. Oh, okay, my writer brain is whirring at full speed right now, and there's no stopping it. Now we've got a basic enough grasp of who Boba actually is, not the cookie-cutter goody two-shoes version we got in the show, let's cook up an alternate concept for a Boba Fett story that makes a much better use of his character. Here's what I think we do. Throw away the idea of him being a crime lord. While I am sure that concept could have worked fine, as I said earlier, I can't for the life of me think of another concept to combine it with to make for a complete story, so here's a totally new plot. In episode 1, Boba's going on a contract in a story very similar to the opening Mandalorian episode. A standalone fun adventure where he's being the callous, brutal man we knew from the originals. Let's throw in that moment I suggested where Boba's sitting at a bar and brags about the people he's killed, just terrifying all the locals next to him. I'll play that off for laughs, but near the start, he's offered a new job by the Hut Twins, one worth 50 million credits, a truly ludicrous sum. However, Boba's got his ear to the ground and he says to huts that a lot of bounty hunters have mysteriously vanished as of late. It's a safe bet that they were given this very contract. So Boba says no to the money. He might be a badass, but he's not an idiot. He's not going on a mission where it's guaranteed he's going to die. Uh, he goes on his adventure, completes it, and in the end of episode one, he's reapproached by the Hut Twins, and they say they've done some investigating around Boba Fett's background, and they think he'd be very interested to learn that the target they're willing to pay this huge sum for is a Jedi, and the Huts push his pressure points, mentioning how his father was killed by a Jedi, giving us a flashback as Boba remembers Mace beheading his father, remembering how much he hates that order. The Huts carry on prodding and poking at his trauma to get him all riled up, and we see a shot of Boba gripping his gloved hand tightly into a fist, hearing its leather squeeze. He says, I thought the Jedi were dead. Evidently not, say the huts. Boba gives a long pause before saying, they will be soon. But the huts get upset at this, saying, that's unacceptable, we want them alive, they're worth nothing to us dead. Boba says, nothing, nothing at all. You will not kill them, you must not, say the huts. And after the longest pause yet, Boba finally says, as you wish. The Huts say they've sent others after this individual, and none have returned. They did wise up and put trackers on the last of them, however, so they give one of them to Boba. And in episode 2, Boba gets in his ship and arrives at a new and exciting planet, which is perhaps a lush jungle world, where it's all one big rainforest. He lands and gets close to the beacon, when he stumbles across an area of forest burnt to a crisp, and ahead of him is the corpse 
of Bosk, that lizard bounty hunter we saw in Empire Strikes Back. And Boba strides up to him, not really caring that Bosk is dead, he just doesn't really give much of a damn, but he is phased when he sees that the man wasn't killed by a lightsaber, but rather a blaster fire. And even more curiously, there are traces of a lightsaber being used, but that isn't what killed Bosk, and Boba thinks that maybe, just maybe, this Jedi was actually fighting with the bounty hunter sent to kill them. N what? No, th that couldn't make sense he thinks. He looks around and finds tracks in the mud, but they're not human. If anything, they're machine. So he goes along, following their tracks, until he finds a smoking village. The place has been attacked, freshly too, and there are no signs of life. He walks past scattered around bodies, where it seems nobody was spared. He checks the pulse of a dead man, then closes his eyes out of respect. And he goes along, as cautious and quiet as can be, when he sees graves. Tons of them dug out in a field, ones not yet filled. Then, dirt starts inexplicably levitating in the air, and dropping into these graves. Boba knows what he's looking at, so he readies for a real fight, placing down mines in opportune locations, checking his grenades and pulling out a dart gun much like the one his father Jango used in Attack of the Clones, and he peeks around the corner, gun raised to see none other than Ahsoka. With perfect stealth and masterful precision, he slinks up close, as close as he can possibly get, and fires the dart at her neck. For any other target, they would have been doomed. But not a Jedi, as she senses him and blocks the dart with her force powers just an inch short of her neck and then a real fight ensues as Boba uses every dirty trick up his sleeve to neutralise this formidable enemy. He knows a Jedi is far more powerful than him. To face one in open combat like his father did would mean death, so he uses hit and run tactics, sneaking around, outthinking her as he knows that's the only way he could beat a Jedi. She gets near him, so he blasts her with his flamethrower, and while she's distracted putting out the flames, he jetpacks away, gaining distance. Later, Ahsoka hits is a child sobbing in a house, so she barges in only to find a tiny speaker on the floor, the source of the crying. And that's when she sees the ticking thermal detonator. Her eyes burst wide, it blows, the entire house explodes, and she goes flying into a patch of tall grass, losing her lightsabers in the blast too. She's lying face first in the ground, with smoke coming off her back, and Boba rushes up, putting aside his blaster and reloading his dart gun. He strides up to her, aims at point blank, but she comes to, and using the force, throws him at a nearby cliff with terrible speed, and while flying through the air, seemingly about to die, he fires his jetpack, comes around in an impressive arc, and fires the dart gun. Ahsoka, still stunned and staggering from the explosion, is too slow to stop the dart from hitting her in the knee. Uh, she yanks out immediately, but she knows what this means, so she force pulls Boba back to her, knowing she's got to take him out now, or she is done for. And they have this final desperate scramble of a fight, her getting so close to killing him, Boba getting so close to dying, but just before he does, that's when the drug gets the better of her, and Ahsoka falls unconscious. Boba, exhausted, collects himself and puts a mysterious metal brace around her neck. But that's when the jungle starts to scream. The scream of metal, a horrible mechanical noise. It builds, growing louder with every passing second, and Boba seeks cover, brazing his blaster towards the noise, and that's when he sees hundreds, just hundreds of evil-looking droids appear in the tree line, with a design we've never seen in Star Wars before, a totally new, yet somehow archaic aesthetic. They open fire, and Boba's cover is immediately destroyed. Uh, he rushes away, blaster bolts pinging off his armour, Boba seemingly doomed as he's trapped behind a tree trunk with nowhere to go. And that's when episode 2 ends. Episode 3, we immediately pick up where 2 ended. Boba's jetpack gets hit and damaged, meaning he can't use it anymore, and he's left no choice but to retreat as he grabs the unconscious Ahsoka and runs into the trees with her cradled in his arms. He runs and runs and runs, and after a while, it seems he's clear of the droids. Boba drops Ahsoka, desperately gagging for breath. That's when Ahsoka's eyes open, and using the force, she flays him about. There's a very interesting moment where she takes off his helmet 
helmet and is left numb with shock at seeing a clone. Seeing as she served with them for so many years in the Clone Wars, we could really milk that part of her character for what it's worth, and as she's conflicted as to what to do with him, conflicted by how these clones murdered her old friends, yet also how she has so many good memories with them. But nonetheless, she says he's at her mercy. She demands he remove the thing on her neck. But Boba reveals, as he's pressed up against a tree, that he isn't at her mercy. She's at his. The neck brace is truly uncrackable. It's designed so the best hacking droid in the galaxy couldn't disarm it. And it stands to reason a Jedi can't either. If it goes off, it activates a laser. And it simply decapitates the one wearing it. While pressed against the tree, he hovers his finger over the button on his gauntlet and says, I can take you in alive or I can take your head. You choose. And she lets him go with no real choice in the matter. And as they're walking through the jungle, Boba with his blaster at her back, she tells him why she's on the planet in the first place. And episode three is mostly a flashback episode as we see how Ahsoka got to where she was interlaced with her narration. And she says the huts have unearthed something, delved too greedily and too deep. They found something in the jungle, something that's been producing these formidable droids that have been slaughtering the locals. She sensed it herself, a disturbance in the force from all of the dying, which is why she came. The huts have let something terrible loose, something ancient, and whatever it is, it must be stopped. But after she's completed her sob story, Boba bats this off, saying he doesn't care about the locals, he only cares about being paid. Boba tries to double back to his ship, but he can't because it's parked in a valley that's now overrun with these ancient droids, and it's a death sentence to go down there. Ahsoka says she knows of a settlement where people have been successfully holding out, and it's not too far from here, and reluctantly, Boba lets her take him there. They arrive at the town Ahsoka mentioned, but it's currently being attacked by these ancient droids, and Boba says they need to run, this isn't their fight. But Ahsoka starts running towards the shooting, and Boba taps his gauntlet. Take one more step, and you lose your head, he says. Ahsoka stops, saying they'll die without us. They're not our problem, he says. We're leaving. Ahsoka looks around, thinking things through before saying, to take a Force user alive presents incredible risk. He says nothing. I would imagine if the bounty hunter Boba Fett were to take, how do you know my name, he interrupts. Your reputation precedes you. And I would imagine if you, of all people, were to capture a bounty alive, a Jedi bounty no less, they would only do so if it were absolutely necessary, if the contract didn't pay out, if taken in dead. Boba says nothing. So the huts do want me alive, she postulates. They must think I'm responsible for killing their people. I'm not. I haven't killed anyone. At least, not here. And Boba says, Do I really look like a man who cares? And a darkness comes over Ahsoka. And with intensity, she says, I will make you care. Because we're going to help those survivors. I'm going down there, and you will assist me. That's not happening, he growls. Well, if that's the case, says Ahsoka, it seems you'll just have to kill me. They stare each other down for a long, long while before she walks towards the shooting, and begrudgingly, Boba does too. Episode 4 is when it becomes very apparent that this is no longer a bounty hunt for Boba, but a fight for survival. And so, stuck on the planet, Boba has to fight with Ahsoka to survive, a member of the Jedi who murdered his dad, a member of the organization he wants to see totally destroyed. He has to fight with her to survive. And also, perhaps, she says that she's technically not a Jedi anymore, but he says he doesn't really care. And I love the idea that Ahsoka says she served with his brothers in the Clone Wars and saw the goodness in them. They were all brave men. Boba is so cynical and dark, but she knows Boba has that potential in him. The potential to be a good man. In fact, aside from his father, she's the only person to have ever said those words to him. 
And I love the idea that he sees the utter futility in that laser collar, as she's already called his bluff on it, so he takes it off, and maybe he goes to help her recover her lightsabers from their initial fight. Gradually, he's trusting her more and more, and at one point when they're going into a fight, Ahsoka looks back at Boba and has some intense deja vu. She smiles and says it's just like old times, as her going into a fight besides him with his voice and his tactics, it's like she's fighting with the clones once again. And going along with the grander mystery, these locals they saved informed them that before this all happened, before the droids, these shifty looking men were skulking around the jungle, and Boba postulates they sound like hut goons to him. What more, someone went hunting in the jungle a few weeks back and swore they could have heard drilling. Boba is still reluctant, he wants no part of this, and Ahsoka says his ship is trapped in machine-infested territory. If he ever wants to leave the planet, he has to go with her to see what caused this crisis, in the hope they can stop this threat and finally leave the planet. And Boba again, begrudgingly, goes along with Ahsoka as they venture into this underground chamber that the hunter mentioned, that the huts uncovered. Uh, they see statues, great grand stone pillars, and and Ahsoka, wonder on her face, says she's seen something like this before. This is a Jedi temple, an ancient one at that, it must be thousands of years old, perhaps even before the Old Republic. They also see, as there are only a handful of droids around, that this can't be the main site. It must be part of a larger network of temples, a mere satellite site to what must be the main hub. And that They fight these droids, and Ahsoka rubs her hand on some old runes carved into a stone plaque. A booba asks if it's a message, and she says no, it's a warning to stay away, to leave this place and never come back. That the droids aren't the threat itself, they weren't what the huts let loose, they're just the automated security, programmed to kill everyone in the area to prevent exposure, if containment is breached. And that's when Ahsoka realises it, the fear obvious on her face. Boba says, what is it? What's wrong? And she says, no Jedi would do that. Program droids to kill nearby innocents. This isn't a Jedi temple. It's Sith. They're in an ancient Sith temple. What power could be so dangerous that the Sith of all people decided to lock it up and throw away the key, to keep an entire army of droids as its security, to be absolutely sure that nobody, not ever, could get close to it? What could it be? And I love the idea that as the show goes along, a little like Joel did in The Last of Us, Boba learns to gain the courage to be vulnerable, to let himself have a friend. So much so, he starts joking around with Ahsoka, trying to get her laugh, and they start to develop a bit of a chemistry together. And so we end the episode on a little foreshadowing. Some of the locals they saved are exploring the jungle themselves, trying to find the source of these droids, despite how Ahsoka explicitly told them to stay put in their town as she'd handle this, and the locals find the main site, the main Sith temple the huts uncovered, yet all of the droids around it are already destroyed, and standing among their remains are people, aliens, what one of the locals recognises to be the same people who are skulking around the jungle before the crisis. They realise these must be the original hut goons. but. Something's wrong with them. Their faces are sickly pale, and their eyes are pure white, without any irises to speak of. This terrifies the locals, and they decide to run. And that's when they get flanked, ambushed, and the goons make sure to take them all alive, and drag them into the Sith Temple, screaming as they await an unknown fate. And so, the episode ends. In the next episode, we learn a great deal more about this terrible threat as Ahsoka and Boba are going through these satellite temples, piecing together the large mystery. And it's a dark side weapon forged by one of the most powerful Sith Lords to have ever lived over a millennia ago. So old, it's from before the Old Republic, and it's a weapon that can only be controlled by them specifically. In this episode, Ahsoka sees a tapestry telling the depraved history of this Sith Lord, and their apprentice who was beyond furious at how their master never taught them his most powerful trick. 
the trick to achieving immortality. And so the apprentice, disgruntled, deceived their master, trapping them somewhere and doing it in such a way where the master was made to regret that he had ever attained immortality, as he would be tortured endlessly, kept in agony for the rest of time. And maybe, just maybe, this Sith Lord, one of the most powerful ones to have ever lived, is still alive somewhere in the galaxy, waiting to be discovered in a future Star Wars story. But that's just an idea, make of it what you will. But it's here, on this planet that his most powerful and terrible weapon is quarantined. A weapon that even his Sith apprentice dared not try and control, because if someone gets near it, it exposes the them to their worst fears, and in doing so, makes them break down, losing their resolve entirely. And that's when it has them. That's when it turns them into the thralls of this ancient Sith Lord's will. And so, at the start of the final episode, they're presented with an ultimatum. The artifact's thralls have destroyed all of the droids now, so they can pursue this horrible ancient threat, or use this chance to escape, and they obviously disagree. Boba's saying it's time to leave, Ahsoka saying that they must stay and fight, they have a major falling out over this, and Boba goes to his ship as Ahsoka goes alone to confront this terrible threat in the temple. The doubts creep into Boba's head as he readies to fly off. Perhaps he has a flashback to Kamino where his father once gave him words of wisdom. And this is when he finally completes his character arc, giving himself permission to care about another person and goes back to save Ahsoka. We follow Ahsoka through the temple, fighting Hut's men, but as she does it, her perception of reality falters. Suddenly she is not fighting criminals anymore, but clones, and she's pained as she does it, grieving as she kills the clone she cared for so greatly. And then she reaches the final goon, being given pause as he's holding two blasters and has blue markings on his armour. It's Rex, and he's left her frozen in place. Meanwhile, Boba's going through the same as he's in the temple and watches his father dying all over again. And he sees Ahsoka, he runs up to her, and that's when she gets killed. And he screams out in agony, holding her corpse. He hears his father's voice rattle around his head, saying that caring for others is a mistake. What's the point in caring for someone when they always, inevitably, die? There's no point, he thinks, but that means he must remain alone, remain being the the sad, sad man he is now, and what is the point in such a life? We cut back to Ahsoka, and she's trying desperately to save Rex, to stop him non-lethally, and he's screaming out that she should have never trusted him, that she was a fool for trusting anyone at all. And the hallucination gives her no choice, forcing her to kill him. Then Ahsoka breaks down, the grief, the pain, it's all far too great. And that's when she hears it, coming from the shadows, quietly at first, but soon, it's unmistakable. And Darth Vader strides towards her, the final boss of her internal demons, and he says she trusted the clones, and they betrayed her. She loved Anakin, and he became a fully-fledged Sith Lord, and then she made the mistake of having faith in Boba, and he has proven to be a coward. The voice of James Earl Jones taunts and mocks her, saying she is a terrible judge of character, that she doesn't deserve love love, or friendship, or any kind of intimacy, as every time she's ever gotten close to someone, the universe has made her regret it. The doubts creep in, and Ahsoka strikes at Vader, getting angry, truly angry, as she fights him, her self-control slipping, falling to the dark as her deepest fears overwhelm her. We cut back to Boba, Ahsoka's body in his arms, and he hears the voices, saying what's the point in caring for another person if it only ever ends in pain? And this is when Boba gathers himself, discarding the body, making it transform into smoke as it hits the floor before vanishing entirely. And he stands. 
back to Ahsoka, she strikes at Vader with all of her rage and fury. But she falls, she stumbles and hits the ground. But Vader, instead of striking her down, he carries on with the chastisement, making her wail, tears streaming down her face. Vader says, no one cares about you, no one ever will. And Ahsoka's eyes start to change, her irises disappearing, becoming white. Her face grows paler and paler as the powers on the brink of seizing control of her mind entirely. And that's when the smoky vision of Vader is scattered by none other than Boba Fett, striding straight through him, his hand offered out to her in help. And she looks up at him, holding an expression of disbelief and then finally of pure relief. The colour returning to her cheeks, her irises restoring to what they once were, as Boba proves that when she said she saw good in him, she was right all along. And the two of them united, soldier on to neutralise this ancient weapon, meaning the locals are safe once again. And as there's no way they can leave it here, seeing as the huts would just come to claim it for themselves, the two of them take it to Luke for safekeeping, meaning that the weapon is still in play and we can include this element into future Star Wars stories. We even see Baby Yoda there as a nice little reference. And at the very end, Ahsoka and Boba develop such a bond, such a friendship, that she tells him there's a task to do. There's a gang lord in the Outer Rim who's been doing some truly evil things, and she thinks it's time somebody put a stop to him. And Boba says in his usual taciturn way, sounds like you could use backup. And she replies, any old person can give backup. A friend would be better. So Boba chooses to help her, and as the very final shot, we see the two of them getting into Slave One, ready to go on their next adventure together. There you go, I hope you liked the pitch. Uh, don't forget to support me on Patreon if you want to help me make more videos exactly like this. There is a link in the description down below, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.